You can get the next episode of Sworn right now on the TuneIn app. On TuneIn, new episodes of Sworn are available one week early. Download TuneIn today and listen for free. Place your left hand on the Bay of Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Protests continued this weekend in Ferguson and around the country. Quit resisting. You're un- no, you're it makes no sense. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Judge, you are the last line of reason in this case. Every one of us took an oath of office and we're sworn to uphold the Constitution. From Tenderfoot TV in Atlanta, this is Sworn. I'm your host, Philip Holloway. You know, folks, we all want to eat better, but when it comes to snacks, sometimes it feels like the whole world is either delicious in a billion calories or boring and tasteless. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can up your snack game with Nature Box. Nature Box has over 100 snacks that taste good and are actually better for you. All snacks are made from high-quality, simple ingredients, which means no artificial colors, no artificial flavors or sweeteners. That way, you can feel good about what you're eating. My favorites are their sriracha roasted cashews, apple and cinnamon oatmeal breakfast bars, and when it comes to chips, pretzels, and popcorn, you cannot beat the crunchy barbecue twists. It's very simple. Just go to naturebox.com, choose the snacks you want, and they will deliver your snacks right to your door. And there's no risk. If you ever try a snack you don't like, don't eat it, and Naturebox will replace it for free. Right now, Naturebox is offering sworn listeners three free snacks with your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash sworn. That's naturebox.com slash sworn. Is this Mason Lindsay? Yes, this is. Don't ever call me about this. I, I don't like your brother. I don't like you. And I don't know a goddamn thing about the murder case you asked me about. But I do know about y'all. What a bunch of swine you are. So don't ever call me, okay? <laughs> After decades of working within the criminal justice system, I've seen and I've experienced firsthand the toll the job takes on those who dedicate their lives to public safety. Whether you're a sheriff or a local police officer and a heinous crime takes place in your town, you want that case to be solved. You need it to be closed. And quite frankly, you want the right person behind bars. You've sworn to protect your community. But what happens when a case starts to slip away? What happens when you still can't find the answers after a year, after two years, three years, 10 years, 15 years? What can the criminal justice system do to keep these cold cases alive? When responsibility for solving the case changes hands time and time again, at the end of the day, who really does bear the burden of solving a case? On today's episode, we'll explore all this through the framework of the Weidman case, still unsolved after 15 years. Hello? Mr. Wise. Yes, sir? Hi, this is Philip Holloway from the Sworn Podcast. How are you? Doing good. If you have just a minute, do you mind speaking with me about the Weidman case? I have a minute to speak with you about it. It's my understanding you were one of the first people to arrive on the scene. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I was the first one to get there. I was actually a firefighter for the county fire department, Turner County back then. So I, I was a volunteer. So that morning we had a had a fire. I responded in my personal vehicle because I was by the fire department, and another guy was picking up the fire truck. So I got to the scene before he did. So you were actually the first person to arrive? Yes, sir. I was the first one to arrive. At 3.25 a.m. on March 22, 2002, a truck driver passing through Rebecca, Georgia, saw a large fire from the highway. After the driver called 911, the Turner County Volunteer Fire Department responded, and James Wise was the first one at the scene. When I got to that place, I drove all the way up the driveway. 
I backed all the way just about out to the highway where they had some double gates, and I parked there. It was a real dark night. Sometimes you have those feelings. I walked up to that house, and it was dark, and just had a bad feeling that morning. Once I looked around and I seen all the cars there, I just had a feeling those people was in the house because all of their vehicles were home. The property belonged to the Weidman family, and the house there was engulfed in flames. Within minutes of the firefighters' arrival, the roof of the one-story home had collapsed. The Weidman's vehicles were parked around the property, but the Weidman family was nowhere to be found. When I got there, the whole house, you could see the whole front of the house. It wasn't burning, burning, but the end of the house was. But it was a very windy morning. It was was real windy that morning. It was just pushing the fire. Actually, it pushed the fire all the way from one end of the house out the other end, they had a big field of pine trees there, and it actually caught those trees on fire out there. I went to the front door, and I didn't open the front door. The front door was shut, and I can still remember it real good. It's a solid white front door, so I made it to the door, but I wasn't ever able to make entry into the home. I called on the radio and informed them that uh, all their cars was there, and I felt like that, that they possibly was in the house. I actually called and told them they was probably at home. If I can remember properly, it seemed like we was on the outside of the house and could look in one of the bedrooms when we first discovered one of the bodies. 51-year-old Tommy Joe, or T.J. Weidman, 48-year-old Deborah wheeler Weidman and their 22-year-old pregnant daughter, Melissa, were found dead inside of the decimated home. They was very bad. They was like their legs. It was just like their torsos left. It burnt. It, they was burnt pretty bad. We put the victims in body bags. They loaded them up. They took them to, have a, to the crime lab, I think, where they took them. But when they left, it didn't take them long. They called us back. We were still on scene. The sheriff, he found out when we got back, these people been shot. It started as a terrible and inexplicable house fire. But when the fire ended, a more disturbing mystery began. The fire hadn't been the cause of death for any of the Weidmans. All of them had been shot. And the fire, that was deemed the result of arson. It wasn't immediately apparent that they had been shot. It took some further examination to figure that out. That's right. Actually, they was just kind of treating it like it wasn't, like they hadn't been shot or anything like that. After they called back, everything changed. Right after the GBI got there and started talking, they wanted to interview him. And he asked me, he said, what made you feel like something was wrong here today? I said, well, I said, the first thing, ever who called, they wasn't here at the house when I got here. And they said a truck driver. I said, so it raised my suspicion it just, Things was out of the ordinary. I said, so I just got here and I seen all the cars here, and I felt like the people were at home. I did not know they had been shot or anything like that, but things just wasn't. By the time I got there, I said, well, something's wrong. There ain't nobody here. Because nine times out of ten, if a person calls, they wait till we get there. If they're sitting there, there was no one there when I pulled up. It's about 12, 13 miles from Ashford. Like people responding to the fire, most of them had to come all the way from Ashford. I know the sheriff got there pretty quick, and, I, and I'm going to be honest, I, I kind of looked around and watched things, and I know that uh, I can't remember him going to Mr. Charles Henry's, which was the uh, guy that was deceased in the house, his brother, because we had him had the fire fully extinguished, and uh, I remember him pulling up out front he got out and looked, and, you know, and he left. He didn't stay real long. But after it got daylight, there were several law officers there. And like I said, they called the GBI in. They came to the scene because he uh, interviewed me at the scene, the GBI did. It was the same day. So then it, it seems that the sheriff brought the GBI in pretty much right away. Yes, sir. Who was the sheriff at that time? Randy Kendrick. Was it your impression that the GBI took over the case from the very beginning? Yes, sir. They they took over the case. Did anybody at the GBI or anyone in law enforcement ever talk to you about any potential suspects that they might have or they may have been looking at? 
medical nurse, and they never talked to me after that day. After the GBI talked to me, I no one ever contacted me. What was the coroner's role in this? You know, him being the coroner, he's just the one that, you know, flaps them dead and comes out and gets them. But he's the one that made the call back after he, he took the body. Do you remember who the coroner was at the time? I'm pretty sure it was Edgar Perry. Do you know what Edgar Perry's normal job was? Yes, he owns uh, Perry's funeral home, or he was more than the owner of him and his brothers. So he's not a medical trained person. He's not a physician. He's a funeral home owner or a funeral director who also right. is the elected coroner. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So he would have had to have some medical professional help him determine that they'd been shot. Yes. For clarification, the coroner, Edgar Perry, is an elected official, not a physician, but a funeral home owner in Turner County. He wouldn't be the sole voice in determining the cause of death for the Weidmans, but he would be the one to certify their death within his area of jurisdiction. The incident took place in the small town of Rebecca, Georgia, which is part of Turner County, roughly two and a half hours south of Atlanta. Rebecca is a quiet place without a lot of devious crime, least of all, a triple homicide. Firstly, Rebecca is really, really small, only about 0.8 square miles, not exactly the kind of place you'd think of as a hotbed for crime. According to the latest census records, there's a population of under 200 people. The next biggest town, about 12 miles away, is Ashburn, with a population under 4,000. I know you've heard me talk about my sleep number 360 bed and how great I sleep. Maybe you've considered a sleep number bed, but thought you couldn't afford one. But can you really afford another restless night's sleep? I've got some great news. There's never been a better time to come to a sleep number store where all beds are on sale during the biggest sale of the year. The sleep number bed lets me choose the comfort and support that's right for me. It adjusts on each side of the bed, so it's the perfect bed for couples. Now there's also the amazing new sleep number 360 bed. It's so smart that it actually senses your every move and automatically adjusts to you so you stay sleeping comfortably throughout the night. My sleep number setting is 55 and last night my sleep IQ score was 92. That's 92 out of 100 people come in during the biggest sale of the year where all beds are on sale including the new sleep number 360 smart bed. Plus right now a queen C2 mattress is only $6.99. The sale ends Sunday. You'll only find Sleep Number at any of the 550 Sleep Number stores nationwide. Find the one nearest you by visiting sleepnumber.com. Be sure to tell them that Philip Holloway from the Sworn Podcast sent you. Farming's still probably the main income, but there's no factories or anything down in Rebecca except some little convenience stores. That's Patty Jones, whose mother and her whole family were from Rebecca. Growing up, Patty spent a lot of time there, and knew T.J. Weidman personally because his family owned the local hardware store. We were all shocked because T.J. was loving, kind person. He would never hurt anybody. He was always helpful. He uh, had a great sense of humor. He was disabled. I don't know if it was by birth, but he had a hard time getting around and walked with a cane, so he couldn't ever really hurt anyone was just a great guy to be around, always cheerful, even though he was in a bad disposition. When I saw TJ at the Mart, we started talking because we were trying to catch up. And he told me that he was the tax commissioner of the county. And you know that that job, a lot of people don't like you because of that. And so we laughed about it. And uh, he talked about his daughter, Melissa, was pregnant You know, I was like, wow, that's great. And he didn't tell me that she wasn't married, but I really didn't know how old she was or anything like that. But they were all excited about her going to have the baby. So, you know, speculation, everybody was like, okay, well, it could have been somebody that didn't like him because he was a tax commissioner or because maybe Melissa, something's about the baby. And then there was always speculation that maybe because his brother, this was rumor that His brother was not in the will or something like that, so people speculated that maybe his brother had had something to do with it. I know he and his brother weren't real close. Of course, everybody has their own theories, so I hate to jump to one because I don't really know Charles either. That was just hearsay. 
everybody was just floored because everybody loved TJ and he was very verbal and great guy, you know, had a happy attitude and just devastated. Everybody was floored that something so terrible could happen to such a good guy and, and in his family. He was in the center of the town, so everybody that needed anything at the hardware store knew TJ. And the fact that they weren't in their own house that night, they were staying at his mother's house. And how would someone know that? That right there makes you wonder. You'd have to make an effort to get to it. You'd have to look for it. That night, the Weidmans were staying in Tommy Joe's mother's house. This is something they did whenever Tommy Joe's mother went down to her second home in Florida. Reportedly, they stayed there on and off for extended periods of time. Her house in Rebecca is secluded, not some place you'd easily stumble upon. Down there, you don't have a police. There's no police station. There's, you have to rely on Ashburn. They don't have the facilities like a big city. I mean, I'm sure the GBI came in, but never heard anything about what they found. It's small town, gets passed over. It's becomes, uh, you know, just part of being in the small town atmosphere. People probably just keep wondering and know that nothing's ever going to be done about it. And hopefully the podcast will bring out some more uh, information, get things started. I hope the people of Rebecca will come out and start talking about it again. This is something I've heard before. Small town crime does get passed over sometimes simply because it affects a smaller number of people. In a place like Rebecca, we're talking about minimal government services. We're talking about volunteer fire departments. We're talking about law enforcement with longer response times. We're talking about sheriff's departments that are spread very thin and perhaps a state trooper who passes by every now and then. But for the most part, it's in the middle of nowhere. Local law enforcement, particularly the sheriff's office, responded first along with the coroner. But ultimately, it was the Georgia Bureau of Investigation that was called in and was handed control and responsibility for investigating the Weidman murders. I know a thing or two myself about cold cases and what it takes to investigate them, but I don't want you to have to take my word for it. So I reached back out to my friend, John Dawes, who is a subject matter expert in the field of cold case investigation. He currently works for the Cobb County District Attorney's Office in Marietta, Georgia. Before that, John was a very good homicide detective who I've faced in court many times. And so I know that he knows his stuff. What experience, if any, have you had with a murder or a homicide or a killing where the perpetrator used a fire to destroy evidence of how someone was killed. I've been involved in some cases like that. It's a person's attempt to tamper with evidence to cover their trail. Does it work? Uh, Seldom. When you bring in fire into a scene, yes, it burns evidence in many aspects. But if you're not schooled in how to start a fire and allow it to rage, then sometimes it works against you if you're using that to cover your crime. Arson investigators come in, they can determine the origin, they can determine whether or not an accelerant was used, and then if you have a suspect quickly enough, you can test them for the accelerant. Their clothing, uh, you and I stop to get fuel in our car on the way to the house, we're going to have some gas on us somewhere when we get home. Sometimes it works against the bad guy. If a fire started and doesn't fully engulf a structure, then you can still get fingerprints because the oily substance left by the ridge impressions. If it's a fully engulfed fire, then yes, it's very challenging to get any evidence out of that scene. This is a small town. Rebecca probably has two or 300 people living there. Some related, some are as close as relatives. Everybody knows everybody. And in all likelihood, Many members of the law enforcement community are are well aware of all the residents as well. I think that people who are intimately close to uh, a major crime like this, the longer it goes unsolved, the more they just accept that it won't ever be solved. And eventually, unfortunately, they just stop talking about it and just deal with it as best they can. But rumors always abound in cases like this. That can be beneficial to the case, and it can also throw the case off track. You really have to spend a lot of time dusting off the case 
focusing yourself back into the facts of the case. You don't want to get to a point where you don't remember whether something is a fact of the case or whether it's someone's opinion or theory about the case. So our biggest author unknown phrase is keep it simple, stupid, and go back to the facts of the case, the circumstances of the case, and the physical evidence of the case in order to get someplace. A small agency like this sheriff's office, which I don't know, Turner County is probably eight or 10,000 people, small sheriff's office, and it's probably a widespread area. So their numbers would be probably challenged manpower-wise, but they may not see that much violent crime like in other areas of Georgia. Regardless of that sheriff's office desire to do the best that they can do, regardless of their ability to do the best that they can do, they're going to face challenges because of the closeness of the community. You bring in uh, the GBI, I would suspect they came in from Perry, and those GBI agents are not known by the local people. They're not seen in the area all the time. They don't uh, go to school with them. They don't go to church with them. They don't know them as well, and they may not be as free within their mind to talk to a GBI agent where they might have sheriff's office. Yes, you get more resources when you bring in the state agency, and that's obviously good when it comes to getting the postmortem examinations done and getting evidence processed, but it may make the case more difficult to work for the GBI because they don't know those people like the sheriff's office does. Is it possible for a local sheriff to keep jurisdiction, if you will, for being the lead on the case, but still utilize bits and pieces of state resources? My understanding is that you want to, and you're kind of permitted to, work alongside them. Like the sheriff's office likely had an investigator assigned to the GBI to keep things rolling and keep things between the two agencies. I've been involved in some cases where the GBI came in to assist and they took leads on certain part of the cases. I kept leads on certain part of the cases and it was just kind of communicated between us to keep everything on the same page, make sure that we knew where each other was going. But the state agency comes in as a request from that sheriff to come in and head up the investigation. So I'm sure that there was some working together on the case. After 15 years, what would you expect that an investigator, whether it's the sheriff's office or the GBI, what would you expect them to be doing other than waiting around for, hopefully, for some phone call? There are a number of answers that I would want to gain for myself through this investigation if I were assigned the case today. And I would think that any investigator who picks this case up and begins a thorough and methodical review of the case would come across some of the same thoughts. There are any number of things that that may have been done back in the day with, say, cell phone records, home phone records. The, the difference back then in, I don't know whether they got any cell tower information. Today, we can get cell sites, and it's a very, very minimized area, and it tracks every tower that you hit. There are a lot more towers now. In 2002, you were looking at a very, very different potential with cell phones. They were in existence, but you only hit market areas of towers. There were probably three in the state of Georgia. So North Georgia, up around Dalton and Atlanta, and down near Tifton or Vidalia, there may have been three market areas for cell phones. So I don't know how much research was done on those phones and the numbers that were calling them, talking to them, but that's something I would want to know. I would want to know who the biological father of this unborn infant was, and I would want to talk to him and find out where he was at that night. I would want to talk to her family, the surviving family, and see what she had been talking about, about her relationship with the biological father of this unborn baby. That would be my first thought that comes to mind and my first area that I would want to focus on. Back in uh, the early days when I first started working murder cases back in the early 90s, there were a lot more domestic murders. And then crime trends have changed, drugs have changed, gangs are more, and so there is more stranger-on-stranger crime. But when you're looking at a situation where you have three people, a man, a wife, and a child in a house who were all murdered 
and then there was an attempt to cover the evidence, then you you want to focus on somebody that's known to those people. Would that include relatives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if this is a stranger on stranger crime, why would they try to burn the evidence? That makes no sense. They're going to commit the crime and leave. I want to know if there's any attempt to ransack the place, if there's anything of value missing. Sometimes that's hard to see in a fire scene. But my understanding from a couple of articles I read of their vehicles was there and there was nothing obvious that had been taken from the house. So I've got to look at at a domestic situation. You've got three people that are all at home. It had to have occurred late at night because the fire was seen at, what, 3.30 in the morning. So you're probably looking at a midnight crime time when all the parties would known to be at home by someone who knows them well and attends to take their lives. So I'm looking at somebody close. I'm looking at somebody, if if these people were awake at the time they were shot and looked in the eyes of the killer, they knew exactly who it was. How helpful is it for an investigator, though, to be aware of a motive for a crime when it comes to helping solve that crime? It directs you. Identifying a motive directs your investigation. You're right. It doesn't have to be proven by prosecution in the court. That's not a requirement under the law. But when there is a motive, you separate out who probably did a crime compared to who probably didn't. Greed is an underlying cause nearly every time. Whether it's a drug murder, an armed robbery murder, a domestic murder because somebody, there was a case in Gwinnett not long ago where a man was charged five years after his wife was discovered dead just down the road. Some people choose to kill their spouse rather than getting divorced because they're saving money in their mind. It's a greed thing. So money's involved in nearly every murder case that you could mention. People get greedy enough to cause death. The first thing that I would want to do is open this case up and do a complete methodical review of the file as it exists to see what was known then. Then I want to interview those first people that went to the scene, the first rescue people, the first sheriff's office people who arrived on the scene. I want to get their feelings about what they saw and what they thought. I want to talk to the GBI agents who headed up the initial case. I want to get their ideas on it and where their mindset was headed in it, because that's not always relayed on the paperwork. That's not always in report form. When I look at the interviews, I don't want to look at a typed summary of an interview. I want to listen to the recording. I want to know every word that was said and what the context of those words were. And then I want to look at the evidence that was collected in the case. Was there sexual assault evidence collected during the postmortem examinations? Was there any latent print evidence lifted? What did they find? What did they collect? And what do they still have? Anything that's been tested in 2002 by the GBI certainly needs to be considered for a resubmission because the DNA protocols have changed. There's a difference in how latent prints can be run. It's all very different now. Technology has come a long way. But as to motive, the thing that concerns me is that Mr. Weidman was the county tax guy. 2002 was a boom year. Maybe somebody was upset about their property appraisal not being more or or something that he had to do with business. Although that's not likely, I think it's something that needs to look looked at. But what screams out to me is that their 20-year-old daughter is eight months pregnant and she's at home with them, not with the biological father. So I don't know what that situation was, and I need to find that out. It was likely someone close to the Weidmans who committed the murders, perhaps even a relative. Another takeaway was that we really need to know who the father was of the baby. And finally, most of the time, the motive in murder cases is either greed or money or both. Are you hiring? Do you own a business or are you a hiring manager? Do you know where to post your job to get the best candidates? I'm a small business owner myself, and I can tell you, when I need good talent, it's hard to find, and it's a big job. ZipRecruiter is the way to hire. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites with just one click. Then, their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. This is why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter does not depend on candidates finding you 
it finds them for you. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. And in my case, it was 12 hours. There's no juggling emails. There's no juggling calls to your office. You simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. So now my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, folks. It's free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash sworn. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash sworn. Everything we'd read and heard, this house was not a place you'd happen upon. We looked up the address on the GBI's website and headed down there to see for ourselves. This is Church Street, and the next is, let's see, this might, this might be it. Turn left on no. North Railroad Street. This one up there. This? This is it. Shit. When we pulled up to the property, the site of the tragedy, we weren't sure we were even in the right place. We cross-referenced the address with what we had on the GPI website. We were there. Yeah, it's locked. There once was a house here. Looks like it might be just someone's farm now. That's Mason, our producer on Sworn. You could tell it's really dark out here at nighttime. Oh yeah, there's no lights. No lights. It all started to make sense, the story we'd been unraveling. The road was not a busy thoroughfare. During our visit, it was the middle of the day and still only one car passed us as we walked outside. Mostly, it was very, very quiet, except for the sound of cicadas. The land looked like it was being actively used as a pecan orchard, and there was no longer any foundation left standing where the Weidman home used to be. We made note to ask when it was cleared and who currently owned the property. Then we left. Baptist Church. On our way back from the property, Mason spotted a graveyard from afar. We stopped by the church to see if maybe there was a Weidman family plot. And there was. March 22nd, 2002. During our visit to Rebecca, we knew we had to stop at the local newspaper, The Wiregrass Farmer. We wanted to get the perspective of the local media outlet, one that had covered the case multiple times, right in the thick of it. Next time on Sworn. There are some people that swear they know who did it. You ask them, they'll tell you the individual's name. Well, how do you know this? He's just that kind of a person. In the next episode of Sworn, we're going to take a deeper look into the unsolved triple murders of the Weidman family. We're going to talk to some locals. We're going to dig deeper. We're going to sift through old leads. So be sure to stick around for part two of the Weidman murders. New episodes of Sworn will be available seven days early on TuneIn. Download the TuneIn app and listen for free. Hear new shows from other great podcasts on TuneIn before anywhere else. You can find our new episodes at TuneIn.com slash Sworn. That's TuneIn.com backslash Sworn.